Hi there. In this video, I want to show this build. It's a power amplifier for my function generator, although you may think it looks more like a power supply, which would be kind of correct because most of the stuff in this box is in fact the power supply. Why would you want to add an amplifier to a function generator? Most affordable function generators are pretty limited in what their output stage can produce. I am listing here my FY6600, which is probably on the bottom rung, but more expensive generators are not that much better with their voltage and current limits. The emphasis of function generator output stages is of course to still work well in the tens of megahertz range and allow fast pulse edges not to drive heavy loads. But I find myself to often use my function generator as a programmable DC or AC source wanting a higher output voltage or more current rather than higher frequencies or exotic waveforms. A relatively easy and inexpensive solution to this is to add an audio amplifier. There are even function generators that offer built-in amplifier options for that purpose and some offer external add-on units. I have tried using several audio amplifier modules from eBay with mixed success. The most promising solution I used for some time uses a digital amp based on the TPA3116 chip in a configuration where the 2 times 50 watts channel are in parallel to get 100 watts at 2 ohms. Here it is in a rather rusty recycled metal enclosure. You notice how tiny it is for its 100 watt rating. Opening it up, reveals that this is partly because of the switch mode power supply module, but also that the actual amp is really small, including its very small heatsink. Because it's so efficient, it doesn't need a fan either. So what is wrong with that one, you may wonder. Well, although it's excellent for audio, as a function generator amp, the audio bandwidth is limiting and it can't do DC. Its highest output voltage is also limited to about 40 volts peak to peak or 14 volts RMS, but the most annoying problem is the difficulties of avoiding short circuits on the output. This is such a common problem, it's worth explaining it briefly, if you plan to do similar things. In a nutshell, I tend to group amplifiers into three configurations. Amps of type 1 have only a single supply against ground. Both input and output are referenced against that ground. These are generally unproblematic in use, but because of the single supply rail, the output voltage is limited and therefore these amps are generally not that powerful. Amps of type 2 and 3 use two supply rails. One is positive and the other negative against ground. With these, amps of type 2 still reference both inputs and outputs against ground. This means they are also unproblematic. Type 3 is relatively rare but possibly on the rise because it's often used in digital amps like the TDA3116 you just saw. Here the output is not referenced to ground at all. These amps are fine if you connect a speaker but practically unusable to safely connect to any circuit in the lab. All it takes is that any part of the circuit replacing the load is on the same ground as the amplifier and boom! You short circuit one of the amp's power rails. Even if you carefully avoid that in your setup, which is very hard, all it takes is probing with a scope or multimeter. Even simply measuring input and output at the same time with an oscilloscope is guaranteed to cause a short circuit, in this case on the negative rail. Getting tired of the high consumptions of fuses, I decided to look at a replacement and settled on the OPA541. This one ticks all the boxes for me and being of type 2, it promises much greater usability plus its bandwidth is great all the way down to DC. I found this great block by Tim Jager who was in the same situation looking for an affordable amplifier for his function generator. I highly recommend reading the blog, I leave a link to it in the description. Tim found that the OPR541 is a relatively expensive chip, but you can get a module with the OPR541 on it and it even already has a first stage high voltage op amp in the form of an OPR554 on board. He managed to get the schematic of the board from the supplier and noticed a few improvements, for example replacing these coupling capacitors with 0 ohm links to enable DC operation. 
It appears that the guys in China paid close attention to Tim's blog because Tim's key modifications, like the removal of the coupling caps, are now already done in the factory. I got mine from this seller, UK store 829 underscore 3. Whether that's indeed a UK store in Manchester is maybe questionable since the PayPal payment confirmation named a Chinese seller, but it arrived in less than two weeks in good order, so no complaints. And here it is. Input, intermediate output of the first stage and final output are presented as SMA connectors. Since input and final outputs are also available as screw terminals, I did not bother with SMA. In particular, since the max output current of 5 amps with 10 amp peak may be a bit too much for SMA cabling anyway. It may be a bit difficult to see that the C4 and C5 capacitors have been replaced by zero ohm links. I also noticed that the big white ceramic resistor setting the current limit is a 0.1 ohm type instead of the 0.5 ohms shown in Tim's schematic. Let's have a quick look at the OPR 541 datasheet. It can use up to plus minus 40 volts supply voltage and deliver 5 amps continuously or 10 amps peak. So the job is basically to add a power supply to this module that can deliver a voltage of about plus minus 35 volts to leave a safe margin and about 5 amps current on each rail. You may wonder why each, because that adds to 10 amps and we only have a nominal 5 amp output, but you quickly see that you need that if you think of a rectangular wave where each rail takes turns to provide the full current. DC mode is another case in which one rail will deliver all the power depending on what polarity is the input voltage. But as this diagram, also from the OPR541 datasheet shows, things are a bit tricky. This is the so-called safe operating area. It shows what output current, I-O, it can safely handle depending on the difference between the supply voltage, V-S, and the output voltage, V-out. To understand this problem, you should imagine the amplifier being essentially a linear voltage regulator in a power supply, because it's the same problem. V-S minus V-out is the voltage drop across the regulator. If it is high, meaning V out is low and V s is high, then the regulator, or the amp in this case, has to convert all that extra voltage into heat, which means it can handle only very small currents. I have drawn in red the case for V s minus V out equals 35 volts, which at 35 volt supply voltage means V out is zero, or a short to ground. In that case, 1.8 amps is the maximum allowed continuously. If, on the other hand, the voltage drop is only about 14 volts, it can handle 5 amps, assuming a case temperature of 85 degrees Celsius. The problem is, however, much more complicated because this is an amplifier. If you amplify a sine wave, V out will continuously vary between 0 and the max amplitude, and hence the voltage drop will also vary between a relatively small voltage and full Vs when the sine wave goes through zero. Of course, assuming resistive loads, the output current will also shrink as V out drops, so we hopefully stay within a safe area and move essentially across a line like so for each wave period. From the shape of the safe operating area, we can draw the conclusion that for higher currents, we should try to use as low as a supply voltage as possible, because that moves the operation towards the left, which allows more current. So we know one end of that line will hit the horizontal axis at Vs, namely when V out is zero. But how far to the left does it go? Very few amps can produce an output voltage that goes all the way to the supply rail. To find out, we have to examine the voltage swing parameter in the datasheet. It appears that in the worst case and 5 amp current, the maximum output voltage will stay 5.5 volts below the supply voltage. This means, of course, at 5 amp current, the op amp will need to convert at least 5 amps times 5.5 volts or 27.5 watts of power into heat. This also means for a given desired V out, we need to add about 5 volts to determine the minimum allowed supply voltage or else the signal will be clipped. After all this theory, I started defining the power supply requirements. 
I want Vs to reach plus minus 35 volts to have a large output voltage of 60 volts peak to peak or about 21 volts RMS available and each of the rails should be able to deliver 5 amps. But I would also like to reduce Vs if I want to draw more current and that reduction must be symmetrical. That is both rails are always reduced by the same amount to say plus minus 15 volts. This means it would be very useful to see Vs values permanently on a meter. And although it isn't strictly necessary, it would also be nice to display the supply current values. Sadly, it isn't possible to easily measure and show the output current because of the weird waveforms that are possible. One would need a true RMS capable current meter with a decent bandwidth, which is too complex and expensive to be added permanently. And speaking of expense, I want this of course to cost as little as possible. Luckily I already had a suitable transformer, which with 300 watts is a bit of an overkill. It provides 2 times 25 volts AC at 6 amps, which will rectify to about 35 volts DC. Trying to regulate such a high current is extremely expensive, so I use the same solution as many audio amps, just smooth it with capacitors and use it unregulated. This has the advantage that I can simply reduce the mains voltage using my variac, which reduces the operating voltage for experiments with high currents, which wouldn't be possible if I had used the switch mode power supply, which I did consider initially. As for the meters, I decided cheap panel meters that measure volts and current are ubiquitous on eBay, so why not add one for each rail? I made a whole video about these panel meters, link in the description, so I won't go into details here. The issue with using these meters is the way they measure current on the negative rail, which forces you to use this strange looking wiring to measure the current and voltage of the negative rail. The other problem is that most meters can't handle more than 30 volts as supply current and even at just 25 volts the regulator inside gets already very hot. Since I will be using it up to 35 volts, there is a need to provide the meters with a separate reduced voltage that does not exceed 30 volts. I choose about 12 volts and the necessary circuits are these blue boxes with a Z-diode symbol. Of course, there's more to it than just the diode and you can see more details in the video I mentioned. The actual power supply schematic looks like this. The key difference is that I use a Zener regulation only for the negative side, while the positive side uses a DC to DC converter module to get 12 volts. Also, the Zener diode I use is actually a 13 volt type because I had a couple of these in the spare parts bin. The reason for the DC to DC converter is that it needs to provide the voltage for the cooling fan. The fan speed is regulated by a fan controller depending on an NTC temperature sensor. This is to avoid excess noise because when the amp is used mainly to drive high voltage, there is not much heat to dissipate. The fan controller is this one, which is way too complicated to set up with all its thresholds and ramp up and down settings. I'm not getting into details because it would easily fill a video by itself. It works fine once you figured it out, but I will look for a simpler solution next time. For the DC to DC converter, I selected this one simply because it can handle up to 42 volts input, which is quite rare. It's a switching regulator that is pin compatible with the standard 78XX series of linear regulators. Because it's switching, it does not get excessively hot and it can still drive 1 amp, which is plenty enough for the fan and the meter on the positive rail. The transformer is this beast. I added already an inline fuse holder into each of the secondary circuits. The idea is that these 6 amp fuses are more of a last resort damage limitation measure and should not need frequent replacement, so an inline attachment saves a lot of space. The transformer is from Vi Vigotronics and delivers the needed 2 times 25 volts AC at 6 amps. What you see here is the inner frame and bottom panel. It is made from blue coated sheet metal and its main drawback is that the bottom, front, rear and the U shape that forms the top and side panels have no electrical contact with each other because the white frames you see are plastic. 
This means extra earth wires to ensure that all parts are properly grounded. Because I wanted the option to use this amp floating, I decided to replace the sheet metal front plate with one made of ABS, which is also way easier to cut holes in for the panel meters. The front plate prints are done with my usual method of laser printing and laminating. A while ago I made a video about that method which I link into the description. With this type of panel meter it's necessary to remove the PCB to get the frames to clip into the front panel cutouts. This is the rear of the front plate with the meter PCBs back in place. In the center is a rotary switch for the attenuator and on the right is a metal bracket that will hold the DC converter and fan control board. Below that is a fuse holder for a 5 amp fuse in the output of the amp. I put together an attenuator as I just mentioned. The OPR541 module as it is has an amplification of 33 and a bit. Based on that I calculated the resistors for a very simple attenuator. It is reasonably accurate and uses resistors that I had to approximate the calculated values. The sixth position of the rotary switch allow an overall amplification of 0, 1, 5, 10, 20 or 30. This is the fan control board as you get it. The red and black wires are for the 12 volt input. The fan plugs into the socket on the top left. The problem is that this board has basically no provisions for mounting it. To solve that, I replaced the red and black wires with a 3 pin header to make it pluggable. The third pin is not connected but useful for adding mechanical strength. With this modification, the fan control board plugs into a 3 pin socket on this perf board that houses the DC to DC converter and you can also see the tiny 13 volts Zener diode and the large 1K resistor that provides the voltage limitation for the meter and the negative rail. This 2 watt resistor gets hot so it has some clearance to the board. The wiring is very straightforward and all connections go to the two blue terminal blocks, one for the positive and the other for the negative rail. For the rear plate I used the original sheet metal panel that came with the enclosure. It holds the fan on the right and on the left the IEC power input socket. In between are three banana sockets which will give direct access to the DC power rail. My idea was that access to a 2 times 35 volt 6 amp DC power supply may come in handy for other experiments or tests one day. The last thing to mention is the large metal shelf which will hold the smoothing capacitors. The capacitors are of a type that are specially rated for DC power supply filtering and can handle between 5.5 and 3.5 amps of ripple current depending on temperature. Handling ripple is quite important in this application. Each rail will get two of these in parallel. Although the capacitors are in an isolating PVC sleeve, I decided it would be no harm to further isolate the shelf itself using two layers of captain tape. The capacitors are fixed on the shelf with tie wraps. This keeps them secure but allows replacing individual caps if that should ever be needed. I prepared a heatsink for the two rectifiers by drilling two holes and cutting M5 threads into them. With a thin layer of thermal paste, both of the rectifiers will go on this common heatsink. This works because the metal housing of the rectifiers are isolated from the diodes inside. Time to put the items that go into the center of the housing together, starting with the rectifier, the transformer and the amp. Normally I wire simple things up without much prior documentation, but for this build I spent quite some time to actually do a DC wiring diagram on the computer first because this one is rather complex, mainly because of the weird way the current meters need to be connected. With 2 times 35 volts at 6 amps, the consequences of a wiring error could be, let's say, exciting. As an example of the complexity, you can see there are four different zero volt lines that must not be mixed up. To help me with that, I created a strict color scheme for all the wires. The purple one is in reality white, but white wires in a wiring diagram are basically invisible, hence I used purple in the drawing. All the wiring is routed to this central distribution block, the terminal block up here are for the wiring to the meters and the DC converter board which is not part of this diagram. 
the central distribution block with some of the wiring. The wires to the front and rear panels are still missing. From the top you can see that I wired up the front panel and the rear panel as far as possible before starting with the connecting wires to the distribution block. When I powered it up everything worked as it should, so the time making the diagram really paid off. The only issue is that the positive current shows a persistent current of about 40 milliamps when there is no current flowing. It's really a bug of the meter and I'm wondering if I should get another one. For now I just ignore it as the error is pretty small. For the high current carrying connections I used wires with at least one millimeter square cross section area which makes the wiring rather bulky. In hindsight the heatsink for the rectifiers could be much smaller. Even at high current they hardly get warm at all. It might be interesting to see the behavior at reduced mains voltage because that is definitely something I will use when I need more current. In the rear you see the voltage of the positive rail tapped off from the sockets at the back. There's no problem going down to just about 12 volts which was my design goal. And just below 12 volts the DC to DC converter on the positive rail shuts down so the upper display goes dark and more importantly the fan stops. At just below 11 volts the lower meter starts blinking because its current draw causes a voltage drop across the 1k resistor which reduces the operating voltage below minimum. But as soon as the display shuts down the current draw drops to nearly zero which reduces the voltage drop. Seeing now a voltage well above its minimum the meter restarts and so the cycle continues. With a lower resistor and hence a beefier Cena diode I could delay the onset of this condition to lower voltages but since there is no upper meter and no fan cooling voltages below 12 volts are not usable anyway. At below 6 volts both meters have completely shut down. Just for fun here is a 12 volt 25 watt car light bulb connected to the output when the input is a 0.2 hertz sine wave. The current readings of the meters have trouble keeping up. And here is a small DC motor fed by a triangular wave. On the meters you can see the current is alternating between coming from the positive and negative rail. A couple of waveforms from a function generator measure the output of the amplifier with no load. I think the frequency was 1 kHz, unfortunately the upper part of the scope screen is cut off in the video. Sine, rectangle, pulse, needle, triangle, sawtooth. One parameter that interested me was the bandwidth. The datasheet of the OPR 541 lists the power bandwidth at a load resistance of 8 ohms and 20 volts RMS as between 45 to 55 kilohertz. 20 volts at 8 ohms means 2.5 amps or 50 watt output power. That sounded like a good test to try to replicate. The 8 ohm load is one of my power resistors on that heatsink in the front. It gets very hot so I rigged an additional fan to blow over the heatsink. The output current of about 2.5 amps is shown by the O1 meter. It is just for control of my initial setup and won't be able to read anything once the frequency gets above 8 kHz or so. The scope shows the output voltage while the function generator is increasing the frequency in steps. I sped this up a bit so you can clearly see the frequency increasing. The actual measurement is done by the Edgeland 3441A. Both the function generator and the 3441A are under remote control. At every increase in frequency the multimeter measures the RMS voltage and then the frequency and my control program saves that data in a spreadsheet. The result is this graph which looks nice enough. If you check the intersection with the 3 dB line shown here in red the bandwidth is about 100 kHz, double of what the datasheet promised as a maximum. So clearly this isn't the full picture. And indeed if you look at the scope at 100 kHz there is not much left of the sinusoidal input. Instead we have a triangular wave with some hiccups. At 50 kHz the maximum according to the datasheet it is still mostly sinusoidal with those little hiccups. Those go away when the load is reduced. 
So the conclusion is that I need to stay below 50 kilohertz when drawing significant current, but you can go a bit higher with reduced loads. All in all, there are quite a few things I would do differently. For starters, I would probably replace those voltage and current meters with just voltage. Being able to see the current isn't really as useful as I thought, and at higher frequencies the meters show only some form of average. I'm thinking of reducing the rectifier heatsink and instead increasing the one that came with the amp. Other than that, the build works quite well for my purposes. And that's it for this video, don't forget to subscribe if you have not already and maybe consider become a Patreon, link in the description. As Patreon you get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.